<clears throat> All right, hello friends. No clapper, 686B. Still working on what I call a watercolor sketch. The word sketch covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> uh, it means that I, I give myself permission to do a lot of things that a serious, quote unquote, legitimate watercolor artist would not give themselves. And I say all the time, too, I said in my class last Saturday that uh, you certainly could not get into, say, oil painter, I mean, Watercolor Society of America. Is it society? Anyway, you couldn't get in with this with this kind of kind of work, of course. But who the heck cares? I'm not trying to get in. All right, back to the job. So in uh, in the last few minutes, uh, first of all, I scarfed down a quick lunch. That was not quite in the plan, but it happened. Yahoo. Um. And as you can see, I've decided to work with a Pigma Micron 05 Archival Ink Waterproof. And uh, And the, the main purpose of, of this layer is just <clears throat> visual play. I can use that term. It's just for fun. Little tiny bit of, of rendering or accuracy, if you will but mostly just for fun. So, and it's a considerably finer line, of course, than the uh, fountain pen I was using earlier. The fountain pen is much more expressive. <coughs> um, it, it does thick and thin. This, this pen, not quite as much, and, but it's a finer line. Anyway, uh, that's all pretty obvious, I'm assuming, so I prattle on for no good purpose. <laughs> prattle, prattle. <laughs> hey, it's that Dan Nelson guy again. Let's go watch him prattle, or listen, as the case may be. And some of you are saying, I don't get what's prattling. It's what I do. That's what I <laughs> Rambling on about not much in particular. I think then, I think now I'm going to uh, pursue a little bit <coughs> of local color. If I can find it all in the notes, here's the main thing, the main page of notes. Uh, that's right, this chair. Oh, that brush is way to always use the largest brush you can possibly get away with, right? Now, you know what? I think I did learn that in college. Yay! Four years of college education. I remembered one thing that I learned. <laughs> um, Always use the bit largest brush you can get away with. So that chair is green. This chair, hang on. I am missing a page of notes, folks. I'm going to have to... Rats, I thought I had everything all lined up. Evidently, I don't. Thank you, Uncle 60, for the recommended uh, noise canceling 
I, I don't think that's I don't think that's what I, that's going to do it though. Um, the problem is I get the same noise sometimes when I run from one of my battery packs through a USB. Whatever. Whoops! Let me unplug now. There. I don't know if we were getting noise or not, but anyway, thank you. I will probably buy one of those anyway just to see if it works. But that it won't solve the problem because I get the same uh, the same noise issue. Oh, here we go. There's the desk chair. Well, this is kind of a pale gold color. It doesn't doesn't help me a lot because it's already a pale gold color. <laughs> Let's do some of the, uh, th this desk here has dark wood, has, looks like a slate stone surface on it. <clears throat> and there's a stool underneath the desk. Also, it's brown with some books or something like that piled up on it. And there's some books there. This lamp is essentially gray. Let's do some wooden frames around some of these paintings on the wall. Let's do a uh, gold frame. I don't know if gold frames are in or out. That's a bad thing about me doing renderings. I don't keep up with current trends in hardly anything. Designerly clothing, uh, you know, it's just not my, not my thing. So if you want me to do a rendering for you, you better tell me what's in and what's not. <clears throat> Some dark pillows, one brown pillow. I'm going to pick up a small brush for this one. Oh, and a, and a uh, frame around this mirror. Maybe it's gold, but maybe it's just wood. Who knows? And uh, while I've got this dark yellow ochre here, let's do some of the stripes on the ottoman. Thank you, Horatio, for, <laughs> um, uh, for ottoman. <laughs> helping me remember those words. And here, pretty soon here, I'm going to be ready to do my first layer of Um, white and uh, there are many different many different tricks that I use for the white layer depending on the mood that I'm in and I think today well, this chair has black legs. Let's make sure we get that get that right too. I think today I'm in the mood to do <clears throat> my white with um, hang on, looking at my notes again. This this blanket here, this comforter here on the base of the bed is
What color? Hang on, sorry. I better not rush ahead. Here we go. Bed. There we go. Okay. So yeah, it's got these kind of kind of greenish blobs with with goldish filigree kind of stuff in between the gold the green blobs. It's a pretty good description, don't you think? Green blob <laughs> green blobs goldish filigree not uh, filigrees yeah i guess good enough um so i'm going to do um uh, my first layer of white with uh, acrylic gouache acrylic no no acrylic gesso sorry about that acrylic gesso so the my my rationale here is that the um sorry this area right here is supposed to be brown the gesso will dry um waterproof impervious to water so that i can easily come back and do layers of color on on top of the gouache all right and i think i'm ready to go to that right now so if i give you just a second let me go over here again to my somewhere one <laughs> one of my watercolor kits all of a sudden I'm not sure which one all right I think I think it's in this bag right here but maybe not so <laughs> bear with me I've got a little container nope I don't think it is there hang on Um, here it is. It's in my, it's in my big watercolor kit. So there, see, acrylic gesso. Can you read that? Of course. Now, one of the nice things about, you could, you could do this white out, this white layer. And again, please understand that this is like watercolor for idiots, right? All you, all you, <laughs> all you, if there are any purists watching me right now, you're rolling your eyes and say, oh my goodness because no watercolorist worth his salt would would pull a stunt like this and use opaque white so there you go i'm a watercolorist not worth salt <laughs> whatever that means And just whatever I feel like making white, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Um, and part of the trick, part of the trick, part of the shtick here is that... Um, I can come on top of this white with more washes and I will almost certainly do that. Does that make sense? So what's going what is going on right now is pure white is likely to be toned down here in a little while with a, a a wash a watercolor wash going on top of it so again so if I, again I'm making no pretense of being in this in my technique that's why I call it watercolor sketch so I can get away with moita <laughs> I can do whatever I want leave me alone I told you it wasn't real watercolor I can do real watercolor 
and, and enjoy it sometimes. I was a watercolor major in college and spent most of my um, illustration career doing quite a bit of watercolor among many other mediums. Um, I always say that word that way because if there's any English majors listening, they're saying, uh-uh, it's media, media, the plural for the plural for media, medium is media, not mediums. And you know what? <laughs> Don't jump in a lake. <laughs> I, um, I think it's because art majors aren't necessarily given to over f f grammatical fussiness. So I think if you say to a bunch of art majors, what media do you use? They'll think you're talking about social media or something like that. So anyway, I call, I call art mediums. When there's more than one, I call it mediums. Oil, watercolor, acrylic, pastels, those are all mediums. And of course, if you'd rather think that mediums are people on the side of the road that tell your fortune, that's your prerogative. <laughs> and I'm just saying that to drive you English majors crazy as well. <laughs> I'm trying to get you all flustrated. <laughs> um, some of you are saying, I don't get it. What's funny? Uh, that's all right. You don't have an English major in your room, in the room with you right now. <laughs> there, isn't that's getting a little bit, it's getting a bit pretty, isn't it? had a real decision to make um, with this rendering and that was uh, would it be a nighttime scene the windows would be dark and all the light in the room would be coming from the light fixtures or do I make it a daytime scene and as you can see that's the way I've chosen so that all the light fixtures are essentially in darkness and you can see that's the way I right or wrong that's the way I chose to go with it I hope my client agrees with my incision <laughs> I'm just being stupid now that's not even clever <laughs> By the way, for this, if there's any philologists among us, a philologist is a lover of language. Uh, the most famous philologist that most of us have ever heard of was J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. He was a philologist at Oxford. And it's, it's, it's a, he was a very gifted linguist, so gifted he made up his own languages and they, they show up in his books um, but philology is not language per se it's the study of how languages evolve and develop and come into being and so on and so forth and I am no expert at all but I am a amateur all that means is I don't have to pass any tests or write any dissertations it just means I love the subject and read a few books about on the sub in the area of philolo philology <laughs> and how language develops and it's in my opinion quite quite fascinating and since I'm here sitting here butchering the King's English driving your English majors crazy um, I'll go ahead and tell you one of the one of the principles one of the the way language works <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to be a snob for a minute. Okay, just forgive me. Put on your put on your snob ear plugs. 
Um, this, this is the kind of snobbery that a philologist, or like me, an amateur philologist, this makes us roll our eyes, okay? And I know, forgive me, I'm going to be insulting a whole lot of nice, wonderful people. But anytime somebody gets up to make a speech, a sermon, a speech, whatever, and they begin by quoting a definition out of the dictionary, sort of as a, as a starting point, as a point of reference, as a sort of an authoritative, you know, Webster defines philology as the lover of language. And then they proceed with their lecture. Um, just understand that's all right. Then the person might be very, very, very intelligent and gifted and what their speech might be good. But the beginning of their speech is not good because a person who does that is not a philologist. <laughs> a person who does that does not understand how language works. And, and I'm just saying that because you hear that kind of thing so often among people that, that make speeches. It's, it's one of the most common ways to begin a speech. It, um, it should not be, in my opinion, it should not be a common way to begin a speech. Because what those people are doing is they're quoting a dictionary as if the dictionary is an authority. You know, the dictionary, dictionary defines this or that or thus and so as thus and so and this and that. <laughs> Therefore, proof that I know what I'm talking about. They, they, that's, why they're right. that's why they're quoting a dictionary, to prove to you that they know what they're talking about. But that is actually not the way what a dictionary does and not the way a dictionary works. A dictionary is not an authority <coughs> at all. A dictionary is not an authority on language. All a dictionary is supposed to do, and again, all philologists understand this, a, phil a dictionary <laughs> is supposed to report the way language works. It's post priori, not a priori. It's after the fact, not before the fact. So the, the dictionary is not our master. Um, all the people, all the speakers of a language, they are the authority. Words mean what they mean, no matter what the dictionary says. The dictionary's job is to scramble and try to catch up to what, to the way real people use uh, words. I'm not sure that's making any sense to you. All right, but I have one more point to make before I get off my high horse. <laughs> well, I'm still being a snob. More, more snob alert. Whoop, 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 whoop. Snob alert coming. <laughs> Um, language advances on the shoulders, if you will, to use picturesque analogy. Language advances on the shoulders of two groups of people. And I could be really rude here just for a minute, forgive me. So again, put on your, put on your rudeness goggles. But you'll, you'll see, you'll know what I mean, it's quick. Language advances on the shoulders of two groups of people, and those two people are smart people and dumb people. <laughs> That's horrible, absolutely horrible. At least I know when I'm being horrible, okay? Give me some credit. Most people don't even realize when they're being horrible. I am being horrible, and golly, do I feel bad about it. <laughs> you can tell, you can tell. <laughs> Look at, listen to me weep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm a nice guy. I'm just not that nice yet. Okay. So language advances is moved along by smart people and dumb people. Of course, I'm being facetious on, on so many levels. Not even funny. Uh, language advances because many people in any given language, any given group, language group, don't really know the rules and know the language and they mess up. Okay? And if enough people mess up often enough, they will in fact turn, change the dictionary. They will in fact uh, change the meaning of words. 
again, because the, the dictionary is not the expert. The dictionary is just trying to report what's actually happening. Let me give you a few. Let me give you one example of a, a change that is not yet uh, taken root and, and become permanent. I just mentioned a little while ago. There are two words in the English language that sound roughly similar. One is frustrated, and one that I one is frustrated. <laughs> I think I just said it wrong. One is one word is frustrated, and the other word is flustered. And and uh, many people will combine these two words and say flu. I'm not <laughs> flustrated. There we go. <laughs> I'm getting myself confused. Good grief. So they'll say flustrated. And all the people who are good at language, good at English in the room, will roll their eyes and kind of smirk a little bit. And everybody who's not good at language will go, what? I don't know why you're smirking. It's because flustrated is not a word. It's a combination of two words, flustered and frustrated. But listen to this. If enough people, eventually, more and more and more people use the word flustrated, guess what? Eventually, it becomes a real word. So language is advanced on the soldiers of dumb people. <laughs> Forgive me, I mean horrible when I say that. Now, what I really mean and, and they're not dumb, by the way. They might be geniuses at other things. They're just not geniuses at language. That is, that's, the, that's, that's the accurate truth, okay? Um, so language is moved along by people who don't know what they're doing. Since I'm this far into it, just for, I told you I was an amateur philologist. Um, that means I don't really have to be good at it. I just like it and I like reading about it and thinking about it. Let me give you another example of where the linguistically ignorant among us have, in fact, shifted the dictionary. And I've actually mentioned this one time before, but um, I'll mention it again because probably most of you weren't listening back then, whenever that was. I have no idea when it was. Let me tell you a, a word. It's actually two words, but a word, a term that is now in the dictionary because so many people misused it that it came to mean w w what it means, okay? And it's the word help meet, help meet. Help meet, if you look in the dictionary, it means, I don't know what it says, uh, wife, something like that. In fact, I'm so curious now, forgive me. I'm going to lean over here to my computer, Let's see if I can look this up. Hang on. <laughs> okay, since I'm leaving it for so long. Doggone, you, th you would think I don't have any work to do. In my messy, in my other messy desk. Let's see what we get here. Definition of help meet. Man, my computer's been running me horribly slowly this morning. So. Oh, okay. They changed it to help mate, M-A-T-E, by the way, which is also the way language. Here it is. Help mate. <laughs> a helpful companion or partner, especially one's husband or wife. <laughs> this is hilarious. Then there's ancienthebrew.org. What does help mate mean from the... Oh my goodness. <laughs> so all these pages... They, they, they are all Merriam-Webster. Oh, that is funny. I'm sorry. As an as a amateur philologist, I find this hilarious. Help meet. One word. Help meet. <laughs> so there, there are some of us. Oh, my goodness. Oh, good. Here it's got the history and et etymology. Let's see what they say. I'm going to tell you the etymology of it here in just a minute. <laughs> All right. No, that's enough. That's enough. All right. Point, point made. Okay. So, <laughs> help me means a helpful companion, especially uh, a husband or wife. <laughs> Now, 
There are some of us, not very many, I grant you, very, it's a very narrow, narrow segment of the population. There's some of us that grew up in conservative Christian homes back in the middle of the 20th century. Well, actually for the last four centuries, but until as recently as the, as the last... Uh, the last generation. My, my, my generation is the last one. Anyway, some of you, this is old news, some of you have never heard of this before. Okay, there was a translation of the Bible um, that was translated, that's a redundancy, isn't it? Okay, forgive me. The, the Bible was translated in 1611. Think Elizabethan English, think, uh, think, um, Hang on just a second, okay. Think um, Shakespeare. That's just a little bit after Shakespeare. And if you've read Shakespeare, you know how archaic, how hard it is to read, for us to read Shakespeare, because it's so archaic. Well, the Bible was translated into English under the direction and duress. <laughs> There's a lot of history here I'll avoid getting into. Of uh, King James, King Jimmy. And uh, the Bible, this, this translation of the Bible became known as the King James Translation. <clears throat> now, hi ironically and hilariously, it also became known as the Authorized Version. <laughs> authorized by who? Authorized by this rascally wascal <laughs> named King James back in 1611. All right, are you with me? So um, this is whenever you hear when, whenever you hear on TV shows or old movies, you know they they try, usually they're making fun of people, understandably. Whoops! I just lost my sound. Hello, Susan. <laughs> you know where, that where I speak. I I take it, and I just lost my sound. Okay, I hope I'm still. I'm going to turn up a different monitor and make sure I'm still. Um. All right, so in the King James Bible, which please understand, this is 400, now 500 year old English. The story of Adam and Eve, you with me? The story of the creation of Adam and Eve out of the, out of the Bible. God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make an help, and almost comma, not quite a comma, but you could, I will make an help. Yay! God's going to make a helper for Adam. Well, he's not just going to be, it, God isn't just going to make any old helper for Adam. He's going to make, God is going to make a help perfectly suited for Adam. All right, that's what the text says. I will make an help, but it uses an old fashioned English word for perfectly suited. And the old-fashioned English word is meat. Now, it's not hard to imagine with our imagination. Oh, I can see how the word meat can mean fitting, suited, appropriate, a perfect fit. If you have, if you have a, not everybody does, but if you have a, a linguistic intuition, um, that makes perfect sense to you. Oh yeah, right, I can see that. The word help, uh, the word meat used to mean appropriate, fitting, because it, it meets the needs of, of the person in question, okay? So God said, I will make, and, and it's not a help me as it would be in modern English. The, in those days, um, you used the an, the closed form of the indirect article, not a help meet, which it would be in modern English. It was old fashioned, an help so what God is saying, I'm going to make a help perfectly suited to Adam. And the word is, I'm going to make a help meet for Adam. See, that, there's the pause. Do you hear the pause? And I'm just having fun here. But some of you are learning something that's kind of fun. I will make an help meet for Adam. Meet means perfectly suited. I'm going to make a help that fits. Right? That's what it's so. Help is an old, help meet is archaic English for a perfectly suited helper. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> three, two, three, four hundred years later, people don't use that, that word anymore, and they certainly don't use it in that way anymore. So they begin to think that what Genesis chapter, whatever it is, two, is saying, what it's saying is, 
Oh, God says, I'm going to make a help me. <laughs> this is exactly what happened. People began to think that help me was a word. Now, this was ignorant. This was really, really, really ignorant. But lo and behold, hundreds of years later, yeah, you, you just saw me read it. Um, now the word help me is in the dictionaries. That doesn't mean it, that doesn't, the dictionary doesn't tell us what to do. The dis dictionary is scrambling to try to catch up and tell all of us what we already do. Does it, do you see the difference? So how did I get onto all that? How in the world did I get on that subject? I don't know, but doggone wasn't it fun. <laughs> I do have, here, at the risk of alienating or angering some of you, which I hope it won't, but um, I, let me, let me, this, this philological sense, this, this having a, intuitive feeling about language um, comes in handy. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So there's two kinds of people that advance language. Those who don't know what they're talking about and are make, and make mistakes, like help me, hilarious, joke, mistake, stupid. That's stupid people changing the language. The other kind of people that change language are smart people, and that's a horrible judgmental statement. But the point is there's some people who intentionally make up words because there's not a word in existence that we already do. Now, I vainly, <laughs> as you can imagine, I vainly <laughs> like to think of myself as fitting in that second category. <laughs> That's why I use words like artistic mediums. I know it's wrong, but it shouldn't be. When it comes to art, and let's, let's, you and I agree to come back and revisit the planet in 150 years and find out if my little revolution succeeded or failed, okay? If we come back and everybody's using the plural mediums for artistic mediums, we'll know that my little personal revolution succeeded. If not, I'll be thrown onto the dustbin of history like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Are we having fun? <laughs> well, I'm having fun. Sorry about the rest of you. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and evidently my sound is working just fine. I can hear myself about 30 seconds late, which is not ideal, but it'll do. Oh, boy. Okay, here, I was going to say, here's, I, I didn't get to the part that will make people angry. It is. There is a, there is a, 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 a word, wordage in an American culture right now, a phrase that violates, if you will, all the rules of philology, of how language is um, osmos and develop one to another. Let me give you one of the, one of the, general principles of philology, and that is that language, like water, always finds the lowest, uh, flows to the lowest level. Language, left to its own devices, language will always evolve uh, downward. I'm not sure that's, that, and this is not a depressing or horrible thing, it's just, that's just the way it is. Um, let me use a more specific example. Um, People will not continue to use a five or six syllable word or phrase if they discover a one or two syllable phrase that does the same thing. Now, this, like I said, I'm, I'm liable to get in trouble from some of you here because if you're, if you're politically correct, you won't like this, but if you're open to discussion, it'll at least be interesting. Um, when I was a young, well, when I was a really young man, um, black people in America were called colored or Negro. And I believe that was a horrible era. And thank God it's behind us. I, 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 think, I think that was the, on a number of levels, but that's all right. We'll, I'm not going to go into it. When I was a teenager um, in high school, 
black people were most typically called black. Black is beautiful was one of the political mantras that was very, very common in the late 60s and early 70s. Black is beautiful. Now, in the decades since that time, the term black has fallen out of favor. And you tell me, what are we supposed to, now, what are we supposed to call black people? And you can tell I'm using the term black people. Okay. <laughs> but you know, right? We're supposed to call them African-Americans. Okay. Now, that term, that evolution of terms violates some of the foundational principles of philology. Here's why. African-American. African-American. There's, there's something artificial. Can you, can you, whoops. Come on, come on, come on. I'm not, my texting is not working, y'all. This is so distressing. Um, seven, there's something artificial propping up the term African-American because language will not do that. It will not. In fact, I absolutely predict that the, the, this, that terminology, its goose is cooked, <laughs> so to speak. It will not last. Uh, I doubt that it'll last, frankly, another 15 years, but be that as it may, it will not last uh, long into history because it's just, it violates. Human beings won't do that. They refuse, eventually refuse to do that. What? Refuse to use seven syllables when one will do the job. So simply the, the rules of philology mitigate against the term. So the question is, so what is it that's propping up this, in my opinion, artificial, um, artificial uh, art, uh, uh, linguistic evolution? And the answer, of course, is, if you will, whatever you want to call it, political correctness or... Um, um, hyper racism, which is an, an again, that's a hypersensitivity to racism, hyper fear of racism, um, because America is in fact coming out of a more racist era into slowly but surely into a less racist era, and because we're coming out of that. We're hypersensitive to anything that might sound racist. And, and again, I could, I could go on for literally for hours, and I will not do so. But um, so that's just an interesting, to me, an interesting, as a hobby uh, f amateur philologist, um, that term, the, it, it's, it's destined for the dustbin of history. It will not last. And we use it at the moment because of fear. We don't, because, because we're coming out of an era that was grievously racist, the whole Jim Crow era. And frankly, the great, 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 great majority of white people recognize this easily, quickly. We say, oh, yeah, that was bad. And we are indeed sorry for that era. And uh, so therefore, we bend over backwards. Um, it's like a person who comes out of truly a racist culture um, and then they, they see the light and they go, ooh, I don't want to be that anymore. And then they go through this uh, artificial season of, of evolution in their own thinking where they then try to pretend that all races are the same. So that they're very uncomfortable um, recognizing. They won't, see, they won't say, oh, see that black guy over there? They won't say that. They'll say, <clears throat> do you see that gentleman over there with the, with the blue shirt, even though there's 50 people over there with blue shirts on, that they, they can't bring themselves to say the black man over there if he's only, there's only one or two of them over there. Do you understand? So we go through the season of hypersensitivity, which is where we're at right now. And uh, anyway, you might find that interesting. You might find that whole thing extremely offensive. <laughs> and sorry. <laughs> In which case, I, evidently, I'm just going to chuckle. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do feel bad deeply. You can tell by how hard I'm crying. Anyway, because uh, there is light on the other side of the tunnel, the hyper, the uh, hypersensitive tunnel, and that is where you come to the place where you uh, recognize that all races are, are in fact, truly beautiful, 
and you don't have to be afraid about recognizing and affirming the differences between the races because that's a good thing not a terrible thing uh oh boy philology huh? how do we get on that and, and i am one who makes up words because i hope to be on the right side <laughs> of the language changers all right um I'm still not getting any chats, even though I've got 19 people watching. That is, that is irritating, folks. And let, me, let me see. Turn it back on. Nope, maybe nobody said anything except Heather. Hello, Heather. I'm going to add more um, blue. So theoretically, because I used gesso, for this whiteout, theoretically, I can do colors on top of it. So I, uh, I do think, uh, frankly, I'm uh, generally speaking ahead of the curve on racial issues, um, and that's really, given my background, is really not surprising. Um, even if you don't believe in a god or anything transcendent if you're a naturalist even so and if you've had terrible experiences with the religious people i deeply apologize for that but you you have to acknowledge that people who are at least uh, ostensibly spiritual in their outlook are accustomed because of that they're accustomed to dealing with deep issues and invisible issues, okay, deep like racism and invisible issues like apologizing, for instance. Whereas people who are um, purely naturalists, they don't, they think the only thing that exists are those things that we can measure scientifically. Um, they don't believe in invisibilities. Can I speak that overly bluntly? Therefore, they tend not to be as rehearsed in things like uh, apologizing and repenting uh, and forgiving. So religious people, with all their other whatever foibles and faults they may have, they do tend to be conversant with invisible realities and are gen ten should be more quick to recognize, in this case, uh, the sins of America and repent for them and apologize for them and turn from them. And I think because of my background, I think that is, that is true of me. I've been, you know, uh, my, my family was minimally racist and, and I myself have had a long journey out of the, uh, the tragic foibles and follies of the racist worldview. And I'm at the front of the class, uh, if you will, repenting to black people, who I proudly call black people, not Africans Americans, African Americans, um, for the the offenses of my ancestors. And just in case there's any black person watching, I do indeed acknowledge to you that there is great advantage in being, has been great advantage in being born white in America in the last hundred years. I want to, I'm, and more so before that, but even the last hundred years. And uh, generally speaking, the great, 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 great majority of white people acknowledge this. Hollywood continues to repent for the sins of our forebears. Every time another movie comes out that shows you the evils of Jim Crow and the evils of slavery. That is, that is culture apologizing, if you will. Repenting, if you will. So I'm, and I'm glad to repent again if it helps, if it does any good. But it also means that I'm, I'm pretty free of the guilt and the fear and the hypersensitivity that so many people in our white culture experience when it comes to race. Like everything I've just said in the last hour, I could not say if I were a candidate running for office. I'd be run out of town on a rail. Not because what I'm saying isn't true, but simply because it's, we're not accustomed to candor yet. And that's all right. It takes a while. It will take a while. We still have ways to go. Um, I'm looking at my 
painting, of course. Trying to decide what to do next. I'm close. Um, I think I'm going to uh, tackle the wallpaper pattern next. So I need to go back to the original illustration that I used, that I traced. Can you see? Well, here, here it is in a photograph. The furniture is popping off the walls. Too much, Susan? You're thinking it's too, too forward, if you will? You might be right, of course. I'm still not terribly happy with this dark wooden, dark uh, bedstead. When I was painting that, remember I was talking about Barbara Streisand and about how watercolors, they dry lighter than they go on. And then after I did that, it's too dark. So I have here, um, this is a regular part of my watercolor equipment. It's a bristle, old, worn out hog bristle brush. Oh, good. Thanks, Susan. Appreciate that. Good. That, that, that sounds like a good thing. Yeah, that the, the furniture is forward, right? Good. Um, anyway, a bristle brush for lifting. In fact, while I've got it, let me do a little bit more of that. So because it's stiff bristles, you see, it's like a brush. It's like a bristle brush. I go, well, <laughs> you, know, you know, what I mean, what I'm trying to say is like a, like a cleaning brush. Scrubbing, there we go. It's like a scrubbing brush. That, that's... That's a better description of it. Now, if I need to lift out even more than this, of course, I can pick up my good old faithful, um, here it is, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, which literally erases. In fact, having just picked it up, I think there is, there is, some area I don't I don't like this I won't when I take the tape off I think I'd rather not have this corner come come to such a sharp crisp corner you know what I mean so there you go same thing up here I do kind of like this abstract mark but I don't like it being quite that strong so there it is lighter same thing over here so I'm fading the corners the opposite of a vignette and or a light vignette, if you will, fading these four corners. Um, and here I'm using um, the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser in conjunction with masking tape, which is a good trick if you don't know that one. Here, let me, let me show you just for fun. Let's do this. There's a, there's a place here where I could really use. I would like the seat, the top cushion of this chair to be. And the rug almost looks like it's raised. Well, because maybe because of this band that I have around it. I will look into that. I'll try to look at that with fresh eyes. Thank you for that thought here in a minute. All right, I'm going to. This will be. This could be instructive for some of you. Now, good masking tape. I. I'm more comfortable with this, you know, froggy tape or, you know, instead of the old fashioned tan beige masking tape, which wasn't quite as high quality, the blue or the green stuff is better quality. And what I'm doing is masking off the seat of this chair. And I really don't, I don't need to do it. I don't think I'm just taking advantage of, of to do a good, uh, a good demonstration here. So pretty simple. There, got it. Now, Mr. Magic. By the way, this is called a magic eraser. It took me a while to figure out 
how to use it. Um, oh good, somebody else thinks it's a box too, so I should look into that. It really does act like an eraser. In other words, you really, you really do want to rub it, uh, and it, and it leaves, it leaves crumbs the way an eraser does. And let me pull this up and see if that's. I think that's as light as. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That was nice. So now that the top of that chair is popping forward a little bit, and now I've got another problem. <laughs> uh, let me think about this. Yep, I think so. Okay, let's do it again. Same thing. I want the, now the, am I in, am I in the shot? There we go. I want the front of this, the front of the back of this chair. Am I making sense? The front of the backrest. Of course, if I was really fussy, I could take some tiny little scissors or an exacto knife and, um, you know, cut this out real, really precisely. Well, evidently, I'm just not that fussy. Uh, 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 this particular illustration um, can handle this degree, this amount of uh, imprecision without, without damage, I believe. So there we, here we go again. Same trick. So make sure the edges are all nice and firmly mashed down. Pick up the magic eraser and just rub a little bit. <laughs> that didn't take much, did it? There, I'm done already. Now let's peel this off slowly because there's some wet stuff around here. All right, there. So the, the seat and the back of that chair are light and you got a good chance to watch that. Uh, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser uh, in action. I'm going to do a little bit more uh, lifting. Now, with again, with a bristle brush, um, it dawns on me that here between the, the legs of this, there's a stool under the table and a chair in front, or in, under the desk and a chair in front of the desk. So I have all these dark verticals, right? And it dawned on me that just the way I do in my oil paintings is a good opportunity for punctiliar light, I like to call it, like bits of spots of light coming through the darkness. So that right there, just a little artsy, pleasant artsiness right there. And the, the, the front of this chair if I'll make it lighter, then we'll get more of a sense of dimension. Okay, you, you guys are saying my, <laughs> it looks like my rug is a box. I wonder if I add just another um, part of the border to it, will that help? It might. You might not again and I want it to look like a, a border on the rug and my client did not even say that the rug would have a border that's my own invention if she doesn't like it then I will that would be one of the things then I would be taking out in Photoshop oh you know what I wanted to do and I still kind of want to do wait a minute I was gonna say I wanted to do some spatter Splatter, spatter. Um. this dry? I think it's dry enough. It is the strangest thing, y'all. I'm so sorry that I'm not seeing all of your chats okay. on my iPad, which is the the monitor I use to, to see your chats when I'm all done. So I'm going to turn my iPad, turn it off, and reboot it back up and see if I can fix that.
Um, I'm debating doing a, a slightly warm wash of all of this white. Um, but you know what? I don't, I'm, nope, I changed my mind. I'm, I'm not going to do that. All right, now, several, many minutes ago, I said, let, let's do this uh, wallpaper pattern. This is going to be a bit of a trick. Um, going to be very subtle. Uh, um, try to make it, try to make it distinct enough so that it's visible, gives the impression that um, my client no doubt wants it to have. I think I just missed a chat from one of you wonderful people. Sorry about that. Oops, it's too dark. And I want to put my glove, a glove back on. One that's not damp, however. Thick rug. Yeah. It is kind of thick. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's supposed to be thick or not. Okay, I'm gonna. I hope I'm gonna going to catch up with all of your chats here in a minute when my iPad reboots. I really do like seeing what you guys have said. Fringe, yes, Heather. I, I fringe. I, I caught that one. Um, a fringe is another option. Hang on a second. Let me get my iPad going, and then. Um, and I don't know. I just I have a an intuition uh, that my client is a little bit. Uh, tends toward clean lines, a little bit more contemporary. And I'm afraid that the, uh, so here I am, see this, and again, it's part of, part of your job as an illustrator, as is so often as an artist, is you're trying to predict, you know, it's partly a psychological game. You're trying to figure out what people want, in, even when they don't know what they want. Um, I think it would be too, um, too gritty or too country or something like that. I may be wrong about that. Um, but and I'm, I'm thinking about it even as I say it. I'm trying to decide if that's correct intuition. Um, and if she does want, the, the one good news is she, if she tells me, oh yeah, fringe would be great, then that's an easy add. Easier to add it than it would be to take it off. So I will think I'll leave it off for the moment and we'll find out. We'll all find out together <laughs> if I'm right or wrong about that. Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm off camera. There we go. Okay, coming back now online. Now let's see if my iPad is of the opinion. If it's inclined to uh, give me all your chat. Oh, there we go. 
somebody's apologizing. Banger 355 apologized for the viral wall com comment, rug comment. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> we got stuck on it and went, went crazy with it, didn't we? That is quite all right. <laughs> and and it was worth it was worth thinking about and and i could still come back and uh look at this look at this uh the rug and see if there's anything i can do to make it not look like a box i think it's okay i, I at the moment i think it's okay and it, i think it did help to add those extra lines so that it looks like trim instead of like it's raised up <laughs> Good, I'm getting a vote of confidence from Susan who doesn't like fringes on her rugs. <laughs> we get personal and intimate around here. So, so, Susan, are you a fringe on or a fringe off kind of person? I really have to know. <laughs> if our relationship is to go any further, we have to know. We have to nail this down. <laughs> Let's say it's a fringe issue. Let's say it's not a fringe issue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh. Oh, Michael says make the floor next to the rug a timber floor. Put wood grain in the... Now there's an idea. A terrible idea, but it's not... No, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. <laughs> um... As you can see, Michael, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give it a whirl. I'm not even sure that it, it, it's, I'm not suggesting necessarily a hardwood floor. Yeah, ah, I'll let it go. Actually, I want to take a little bit off down here on, on the ends. Let it fade, fade in. And again, if she, if she doesn't like that, that will not be an easy, that will not be a difficult um, fix in Photoshop, so glad to try it. As you can see, I'm getting messier and messier. I started out so neat and precise with this um, wallpaper pattern. And I think that's a, an appropriate trajectory, by the way. Um, start, you know, have some part of it neat and the rest can be fairly abstract. Yeah, that's good. Um, a little bit right here needs some ink line. You know what? I, I like that floor thing well enough that I'm going to actually reinforce just a few of those marks with, uh, with a skinny ink pen there. She had mentioned green piping on the edge of the, on the um, trim of that chair. Let me try a little bit and see if I can just squeeze a little bit of that in. There's a name for this. Uh, by the way, I'm working for a new client. Never have worked for this woman before. She's in Connecticut and uh, don't tell her this. <laughs> Um, but she gave, I, I, she gave me a couple words I had to look up. What were they? Some of you, well, first of all, a mood board. I didn't know what a mood board was. I figured it out just by common sense, but that was, that was new to me. Makes perfect sense. Let me show you what a mood board is. Maybe this is, this is probably a uh, interior designer terminology, I would guess. Sounds like it. It's a, a page. Ah. I'm not finding it. My papers are getting messy, as you can imagine. Anyway, it's kind of like this, but it has all, kind of like these two things together. It, it shows all the different fabrics and textures and things that are uh, going to be used. So that's called a mood board. 
who knew? Like I said, learned, learned a new word. Always happy to learn new words. By the way, that's one of the things that those of us who are, enjoy language, that is one of the characteristics of people like me. Oh, here it is. It fell on the floor. Is people, some people enjoy hearing words that they don't, um, that they don't know because it, it, that's an ex opportunity then to learn the words. So this is the mood board. But um, I, I can't find it. I don't want to waste your time looking too long. But there were a couple other words. Um, It's not on that page. Anyway, I'm sorry. There were a couple other expressions that I'd love to show, share with you because maybe you don't know them either. I'll share them later. But I just Googled. Just All right. So, Susan. Was, hey, Uncle 60. <laughs> Uncle 60, you continue to outdo yourself, man, and outdo everybody else, I might add. Um, <laughs> no shame, folks. No shame. But if you want to send me a couple bucks of love like Uncle 60 does... Up in Maryland from Columbia, is that right? You're from South America. Forgive me, I should, I should remember. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. And, um, and uh, Google YouTube is sending me some money this month, thanks in significant part to the generosity of our friend Uncle Sixty, a.k.a. Um, <laughs> it's AK, uh, AKA Uncle Six, un Uncle 59. That's what he used to be. Then he had a birthday. <laughs> okay, somebody said a little mon monochromatic. Um, have, have, yeah, I love what you're, you got your conversation um, about fringes. Yeah. Lunatic fringe. <laughs> uh, oh, Susan says, need a little bit more color, Dan. Looks so monochromatic on the left. Thank you, Uncle Sissy. Not Maryland, New Jersey. <laughs> to us Southerners, it all runs together, you know. I'm kidding, of course. I hope I'm kidding. I grew up in Michigan, and, and, and so many people, they get their other M's mixed up. Minnesota, Wisconsin, which starts with an M that's upside down. And Michigan, they get, they get all those mixed up. All right, some, Susan suggests some color over here. Um, well, you know, there's, there's a book here. I could try, let's live dangerously just for a minute. I could put, make a book that's red. Yeah, that's okay. Nobody died. And then I could add some of that same color over here, which is kind of nice to, to balance if you can. Um, and um, I think I was being so careful with the blue that I didn't want to overpower it. I think I was too careful. So add some blue in a couple of these paintings and add some blue into this uh, sky out the window. I do, I really do like, by the way, the little tiny little pop of cool that uh, the blue windows are giving me. Because you are right, Susan, everything else in this um, room is quite warm. And uh, I think it's helping. I just saw a place, I think an excuse, an excuse for some blue on this, the shady side of this little, I don't know, coffee table, I don't know, whatever you call that thing. Also some blue in the chair here. Just looking for excuses right now. Now that you gave me that tip, Susan. Just looking for excuses for blue in particular because I think that's what's missing the most. The, the thing is so overwhelmingly uh, brown and warm and I, I think that's okay I think that's what she's after I mean I think the room is warm the curtain has this very particular whoops that, that, that paper is still wet evidently the, the curtains have this very particular pattern in them and I haven't uh, rendered it 
I, I don't want to over render it. I'm, I'm, as you can tell, maybe I'm quite afraid of overdoing this. This curtain's better. There you go. That one's okay. This one. And again, she sent me. Sent me. Here's here's the fabric that's on the curtains. Vertical. You know, spaced apart. And then that same pattern. Um, horizontal on the trim. I'm sure if I if it's possible I may do more work for this client. It just depends significantly on whether she likes my work. This is the first time I've done anything for her and she likes it. I may get more, which I would like. Um, two reasons. One, <laughs> I get paid. Uh, um, but uh, one of the things I really, really got to admit, one of the things I really did enjoy about being an illustrator was the crazy variety of work that, that would come across my desk. I mean, I can't even think of an example right now. It's just, it truly at the time, and this is when my kids were little, I don't really, it really did make me laugh sometimes what I'd be doing one day and then some, you know, like a bank president one day and then a the sand sculpture the next day, literal sand sculpture, or who knows what, cartoon. I did a lot of cartooning back in the day. I was best known, maybe, across the country as a cartoonist, can you believe that, in the late, in the late 70s to the late 80s. <laughs> it kind of makes me, kind of makes me laugh now. I still enjoy cartoons, but what I do now with my old painting is kind of you know, so serious. <laughs> um, I'm going to do, I think, one last thing, and I may be done. This is a not an off, not an art supply product at all. This is a office supply whiteout pen, and I'm just going to look for excuses here and there and here and there for doing just a little pop of white. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not as focused on realism uh, here as I am just at the, just the abstract pop, if you will. It's the white that I, the white in this, this pen is a little more opaque and of course like here, some of what I what was white I've covered over with blue. So this just gives me just a little added pop is the word I think. Um, you know, uh, arch architectural rendering like this, essentially what this is, it just happens to be interior architecture. Um, fascinating um, art, art form, fascinating art form. Um, really trying to strike a balance between accurate representation on the one hand, and you know, art, artistic 
flare, perhaps even might be the word, on the other. Careful, Dan. Don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. Just because you're having fun. <laughs> Just because you're having fun. That, that's, what, that's when you're in danger of overdoing it. That used to be one of my mostly immutable laws of painting. If something is a lot of fun, be careful not to do too much of it. All right, done. I, of course, I, I can change my mind, but let's do the, the fun unveiling. So this is like Christmas time, always, when you take the wrapping off the illustration and see what it, see what it really looks like. And I'll end this broadcast here shortly. Um, I will, of course, put this paper on my scanner. Scan, whoops, I got a little bit of bleeding right there. Easy to fix in Photoshop. Anyway, I'll put, scan it into my computer and then tweak it in Photoshop. And the goal, for me at least, this is an illustration, right? What, what my client cares about is what shows up in her email mailbox. She doesn't care, really, probably, what this looks like. She'll never see this. Uh, the only thing she'll see is um, the, the JPEG that I send her. So always my goal in Photoshop is to make it look better than this. So I can do things like, of course, take uh, um, my saturation slider and go and, and boom pump up the saturation, then I might take like the yellow and slide that down because it looks a little bit yellow to me, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, if I, I'll try to remember to post the finished image, um, the image that I send to her on my YouTube community. All right, I appreciate you, you crazy people texting at me here. Let me, let's turn you around just while we get out of here. Uh, Karen says, we used to put diagonal lines on the windows. Karen, run that by me again. What do you mean? Oh, that's right. Karen is one of our... Um, we used to put diagonal lines on the windows. Oh, like indicating sort of like glass? Sort of like I did on the... I did that. Did you see that, Karen, on the mirror here? Sorry, Anna. Sorry about all the shaking around. There, do you see the mirror? I did that, and then after I did I thought, oh, that's kind of cheesy. <laughs> Not that what you did was cheesy, but it made me a little bit. Stop, Heather says stop. Okay, <laughs> there. <laughs> Only a few minutes after you said so. Um, how would how is my client using it? Some kind of presentation. I'm, I think it's going in a print, in a magazine or poster or something like that. Um, I, I don't know exactly what she's doing with it. Do watercolors, I'm going backwards now. Do watercolors pick up color on your brush as you add new colors? Yes, yes, yes. If so, put blue on top of red. Does your brush get muddy as you go? Yes. Um, yeah, you have to be careful. I mean, if you do it quickly, it'll lay down paint. But if you go slowly or rub back and forth, it will, of course, pick up what's underneath it. Very much so. Um, yeah, the color pushes depth. depth it did. All right, it's been great fun having you guys. Thank you again for, thank you, thank you, Horatio, for your $3 coffee break. I'll spend that. <laughs> Maybe on coffee. <laughs> and uh, it's been fun having you on board. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Um,